Good afternoon, everyone. I am Mitch Connors, and we're going to go ahead and get started. How many of you have been around enough uh, to remember Atari, the 2600 platform? Uh, any, anybody? I know uh, I grew up using the Atari, and uh, now sort of things have come full circle. I just bought my kids an Atari for Christmas. Uh, wouldn't have expected that, you know, 40 years later, but uh, Costco had the special, and I bit. And they're loving their retro gaming. Uh, it's a bit hard to see in this shot, but that's actually an Atari cartridge in the hand of this construction engineer. There's a rather infamous story around this. The year was 1983. Atari was unstoppable. The 2600 sales across Europe, Asia, the United States were through the roof. Every single game was a hit a moneymaker. You just couldn't go wrong with Atari. At the same time, there was a cultural phenomenon going on in the cinema. It was E.T., the extraterrestrial, had captured our imaginations. Now, what could sell better than the intersection between these two amazing products, right? Well, uh, it turns out uh, E.T. was not such a smash hit on the Atari. And this, uh, this particular frame is from a documentary produced a few years ago. This was legend in the software industry for many years, and now it's been confirmed that there are literal landfills full of E.T., the extraterrestrial, for the Atari 2600. They went and found them. Uh, they're in the desert out in, uh, I think it was in New Mexico, Algodonas area. So uh, definitely Atari tried to bury this and hide it, uh, but, but word got out. And so it turns out that the intersection of these two unstoppable market phenomena was a complete flop. Uh, and so we're left to ask ourselves, what caused everyone's favorite friendly alien to end up at the top of a garbage heap? Now, this story has been explained over and over, and there are as many explanations as there are times the story has been told. Uh, it's a supply chain issue that they had to produce too many in advance and weren't able to respond to demand dynamically. Or it's a marketing issue. They didn't really, uh, w they thought the marketing would do itself because it was ET. So I'm going to go ahead and add my reason to the list of reasons on this. Uh, I think that what they had was a lack of empathy for their users. Does anyone here actually get to play ET on the Atari 2600? A cartridge on eBay today will go for well over $1,000. Uh, so it's not surprising. Most of them made their way to the garbage dump. Uh, if you did get to play it, it was nearly unplayable. The game was unbelievably difficult to beat. Uh, and most people who played it never survived the first level of the game. Uh, you could look at this as an economic problem. Uh, Coin-operated games had been the standard for Atari for several years. The 2600 was a relatively new thing. Uh, Coin-op games, you want them to be fairly difficult because you want people to keep coming back. Another quarter, another quarter, another quarter. But once you've already spent $100 on your Atari 2600 and $25 on your ET Atari game, uh, you don't necessarily want that same experience of perpetual death. Uh, Today, you know, games that are per very difficult to play and notoriously hard actually have a niche market. Any Dark Souls players in the audience? Okay, all of the sad looking people just raised their hands. Uh, however, at that point in time, the target audience for E.T. the Extraterrestrial on Atari 2600 was not a bunch of adults who might be willing to really buckle down and do something that's incredibly difficult and obsess over this thing. It was children. It was the seven-year-old who loved this movie and wanted the same experience in front of their TV screen. And so to watch their beloved characters die again and again and again uh, really did not scratch the itch uh, that these particular users were looking for. You could also look at it from the perspective of development, because up until that point, Atari 2600 developers had largely been those who enjoyed playing games, right? Uh, Breakout, Pac-Man, these were things that uh, developed obsession, and those who obsessed over them considered how to make the next version. Well, E.T. was such a slow pitch down center for Atari uh, that they put engineers who didn't necessarily play a lot of video games onto the development team. Uh, and, of course, that, that showed <laughs> in the output here. So what we're going to be talking about today is how we can avoid making the mistake that Atari made. 
Uh, we all from the cloud native community are developing products, whether that be open source projects as a part of the CNCF foundation, or that be the tools and platforms built on top of them, or that be the applications built on top of those platforms. Kubernetes is a platform for platforms and platforms deliver applications. So whatever layer of that stack that you're sitting in, you're going to need to release a product. And if no one uses that product, it does not matter how amazing the technology was, how perfect the marketing intersection was and the research done was. If no one uses that product, it doesn't matter. My name is Mitch Connors. Uh, I have been a software engineer for 19 years uh, and that's really been my comfort spot. But six months ago, I made what we'll see, it might be a career fatal decision, but I became a product manager. I've resisted any other titles for a long time, but I went ahead and took that on uh, at, at Aviatrix, where I work. We provide multi-cloud networking software. I came in to add Kubernetes functionality, and it became pretty clear that we needed a product manager to get this moving forward. It wasn't an engineering problem. It was a product problem. So I'm going to be talking about my experience doing that. But of course, in addition to my work for Aviatrix, I'm also a member of the Istio project, where I sit on the technical oversight committee, as well as the steering committee. We've had our own share of moments uh, where perhaps a little bit more product management, a little bit more user empathy would have assisted the project, and we're going to talk through those. Uh, and uh, then I'm also a Cloud Native Compute Foundation ambassador, which is why I'm hoping that this talk is broad enough to apply to you whatever you're building uh, within the CNCF or within the Cloud Native ecosystem. All right, well, let's get started. Uh, so this is, this is jumping back to my days as a software engineer for a SCADA system in an oil field. Uh, technology had advanced to the point where wireless communication was possible. And you could take a sensor that had been at one point of a process and you could move it to another process. And so we developed software that once that sensor was moved, you could use your iPad and let the data collection system know this sensor is no longer on this pipe, it's now on that pipe and measuring this other thing that it, from what it used to be measuring. You enter it in your iPad and all the calculations now update and reflect the new location of that pipe. Of course, you're, if you're measuring pressure, you're probably trying to find flow rates. You're gonna use flow rates to predict what, how much oil you're producing out of a particular well. We thought we had a really compelling product. Uh, and we launched it and we put it out there and what we found, no one ever opened the iPad app. It was open from computers. We had a lot, of, uh, a lot of desktop browsing happening on the app. We had no mobile browsing whatsoever. And this created a problem because that sensor has moved and it's reporting back to corporate headquarters steam flow rates and oil extraction rates that are fake. <laughs> they don't exist. Uh, and it, we would find that after about, you know, maybe once a month, the engineer or the, the operators in the oil field would sit down and they would update all of the sensors that they've moved. Well, we've already reported a month's worth of wrong data at that point. It was too late in the process. And so we had to ask ourselves, what's, what's the hang up? We made this cool thing. This is like 2011, iPads are cool. Uh, but like now we've got Chevron to buy their employees iPads. Well, you would think that that would really be motivation. I mean, for me, for a nerd, I would be really motivated to carry that iPad everywhere I went. I'd be so excited that I got to work with that. These guys were not excited about it at all. Well, it turns out uh, moving a pressure sensor from one pipe to another involves opening a pressure vessel. You have no idea what's going on inside that pipe and you're going to go ahead and create a hole in it. And, and you're gonna be operating above that hole with your face, you know, right above it. So rather than this nice clean diagram that I had in my mind for what the process of moving a sensor looked like, uh, the real process looked a little bit more like this. Now this is on a bad day, clearly. Uh, but you get the point. The operators in the field, they're not particularly thinking about what corporate is going to think about the data they send their way. They're thinking about how do I make sure that I and all of my crew do not die as we do this? Uh, there's a priorities problem. So we really did not have a great deal of empathy for the end user of that product. Uh, now, why didn't we have empathy? Well, let's, let's look at that a little bit here. Oh, by the way, this is not what he's thinking about in the photo, right? He's got different priorities than we're talking about here. 
Well, let's look at what, was, what, what caused that break in user empathy, why we couldn't anticipate the needs of our users. Well, this is my office, or an approximation of it, at the startup that I worked at at the time. This was the operator's office. There's a, little, there's a couple differences. This was, uh, you know, the average software developer's uniform as he comes into work in the morning. Uh, this was the operator's uniform. You've got uh, protection for his head from falling objects. This is fire-resistant clothing with high visibility so that it's reflective in the dark. All of it is optimized for not dying while you're working in the oil field. Uh, so the distance between my experience and his experience was quite significant. And so launching a product without understanding or appreciating that experience whatsoever r resulted in what you might expect. Uh, not a good match, you might call it a misfit <laughs> for, for product fit instead of product fit. This can happen to all of us because as software engineers, we are writing software for other people. Uh, almost no software engineer aspires to write software by and large that only they will ever use. The whole dream of Silicon Valley is to write software that changes the world, that everyone uses. Uh, and, and I think each of us in our own way are going to be pursuing that. But the fact that our users are not us means that we stand at a distance. And we look at what they're doing and we see something different than what they see. This person looking at a mountain far off uh, sees the snow line, sees the beauty of the clouds above and uh, might be able to think, well, the way that I would get to the top of that mountain is I would walk through these trees, I've got a trail leading that way, and then I would just go up the mountain and I would be at the top. Well, if you've ever attempted to scale a mountain, you'll know that up close, things look a bit different. Uh, this is a, a favorite trail of mine in the Pacific Northwest where I'm from, Asgard Pass. Uh, the mountaineer looks at this and doesn't see the beauty and the tree line, he sees the death area and how not to die. His priorities are very different from the person who stands far off. And so if you are building a uh, navigation app for mountaineers, your priority will not be to use Dijkstra's algorithm to show the shortest distance between two points. Uh, you're going to have different priorities uh, for the mountaineer and understanding those priorities, relating to them, being able to anticipate them is going to be critical to the success of your effort. If you're looking at a mountain from down low on the left side, uh, if you're not very careful about your perspective, you will conclude that the biggest obstacle between you and the summit of that mountain is these trees. If only we could get rid of these trees, get over them or around them, if we can find a solution for the trees, uh, then all of a sudden we'll be able to get to the peak of the mountain because there's nothing between us and the peak of the mountain except for those trees. On the right, your perspective from the summit is going to be quite different. Uh, you're going to be thinking about the crevasses that you had to traverse and how to make sure that as you're going up the glacier, uh, how do you know how much glacier is underneath you? Is there a lot? Is there a little? Uh, if the season is warming and you're late in the day, the odds of new crevasses opening up underneath you increases. So there's a whole different set of priorities and a whole different perspective uh, for the mountaineer. And I think that's a great analogy for what we need to be doing in software engineering. Uh, we need to not be standing far off from our users and saying, oh, I understand what they do, it's easy. Uh, instead, we need to build what I call, and well, this is not my terminology, of course, I think Kelsey Hightower at Google started this. We need to build user empathy. Uh, well, user empathy is the art of taking on the perspective of one's users or, or, uh, or customers. Uh, it's all about being able to see things the way that they see things. Uh, what they think is hard, you think is hard. What they think is expensive or unpleasant, you think is expensive or unpleasant. It's not that you erase your own perspective uh, and stop having it, but rather that you have the ability to take on theirs, to see the world from their angle. Uh, another way to define user empathy is that without which your product will fail. Without user empathy, there is not a path to success. Um, so I told you all that I work on the Istio project and I promised in the CFP that I would be talking a good deal about uh, Istio. Anyone here familiar with Istio, used Istio? Okay, 
we got about a third of the audience. For those of you that don't use Istio today, that's no problem. You'll be able to keep up with this talk. Uh, Istio is all about networking in the cloud. And with the network, by controlling every part of the network, every little piece of traffic that traverses the network, we can give you essentially three tiers of functionality. Traffic management, that is, if you have this header set, you should go to that set of services. Or get requests to this path, go to that, this other set of services. We can do observability. Uh, what's my success rate? What's my latency? We, we can even do trace spans uh, across multi-service connections. You know, if you have a service a dependency chain that is four deep, we can show you that in your trace spans and you can see how much time each takes. And then of course, security, everyone's favorite feature. We uh, use mutual TLS to encrypt all traffic that leads, leaves any pod. Uh, and so, and then you can write auth policies built on top of that. So that's what that's what the customer get or the user of Istio gets. This is a CNCF graduated project. Uh, I've been a part of the project now for a little over five years. Um, the way that we accomplish all of this has historically been with a pattern known as the sidecar. Kubernetes great, gave us this great opportunity uh, to say, anytime you run any software, also run our proxy. And by doing that, by having a proxy literally everywhere your software runs, we capture and control all the network traffic and we can apply all of these fancy cool policies on top of it, provide all this value. There's been a whole hype cycle over it. You can visit the booth in the Project Pavilion if you wanna know more. Uh, but this whole idea of throwing a sidecar everywhere, putting one absolutely everywhere your network runs, it's sort of a brute force solution. The interesting thing we wanted to prove out is, is there value in a service mesh? Does anyone actually need this technology? Will it be useful? Uh, we knew that our solution was not optimal, but this was a quick way. We'll, we'll sort of bypass some of those optimization questions and we'll work particularly on uh, providing value. Well, we're now uh, seven years into the Istio project. And it's time in, the, in sort of the software maturity cycle for us to look at optimization. We've, we've proven out pretty thoroughly that there is value behind these paradigms. So can we provide that same value without a brute force solution that just throws a proxy everywhere? Uh, and so we announced uh, about 18 months ago ambient mode. Uh, I'm not gonna get into all of the technical details of ambient mode except to say that it's an optimization over sidecars. You no longer have to have a proxy absolutely everywhere. You could have 10 services running on one node that use one proxy instead of 10 proxies. Uh, so we, uh, we thought this was really great. As an engineer, I love the patterns. I love that we're getting more and more optimal. Uh, we're trained, right, from the very beginning of our careers to look at time complexity and space complexity. Well, this substantially reduces, in some cases, a hundredfold the time and space complexity of, of Istio. Uh, so we were pretty proud of this, pretty excited about it. We launched it to Alpha a year ago. Uh, and the way that it works is uh, splitting layer four and layer seven. You don't need to worry what those are. Layer four is really easy to do and fairly safe to do. Layer seven is a lot of complexity, maybe a little bit less safe. So every node runs one layer four proxy. It applies all of your security that you need at layer four, which is that MTLS encryption that everyone loves. Uh, and then layer seven is more optional. Uh, we'll say if you have one service with seven instances, maybe you run one layer seven proxy for them. Uh, because of the complexity, we don't think shared proxies are probably a great idea at that layer. Uh, so we're pretty proud of the technology. The patterns look pretty clean. We're excited about it. And we launched it to alpha and we kind of heard crickets. Um, we, we didn't get a lot of feedback. This happens in open source. If you're a user of any CNCF project, please contact the developers of that project and tell them what you think. Tell them the good, the bad, and the ugly, because getting feedback from your users in open source is actually one of the most complex and difficult things that we do on a daily basis. Uh, but we got, we got crickets and we started to worry after about six months. Well, let's, let's look at the values of the Ambient project. From my perspective, I'm not speaking for any of my teammates. I've heard from some of them, no, I was never confused about this, and, and that's wonderful for them. But, but from my perspective, the value of Ambient uh, was because operating a sidecar is hard. If you've ever tried to upgrade Istio with sidecars, it's very confusing which ones have been upgraded and which ones haven't. They're kind of this magical thing, and magic is always difficult to understand. Uh, meanwhile, building a platform, doing platform engineering work and integrating Istio into a, into a platform, which is what we recommend all of our customers do, uh, that's easy, right? 
I mean, I've never tried it, but it sounds easy. Uh, how hard could it possibly be compared to upgrading sidecars? Must be the easy part. Well, uh, what we did was we hosted a Twitter space that Kelsey Hightower was kind enough to promote for us and get a whole bunch of attendees to, where we asked our users, like, seriously, we've sent you surveys, we're not hearing back, everybody join this Twitter space and tell us what you think of ambient mode. A and uh, I learned a lot from this event. Uh, you can see some of the statistics about the uptake that it had in the community. Uh, really thankful for the users that took the time not just to join and tell us what they thought, but explain their reasoning. Here's how I got to the conclusion that I'm at. And in particular, uh, we heard from platform engineers that perhaps operating the sidecar was not the most expensive thing that they did. Uh, sidecars are a pain to operate. They, I think there was general agreement on that, but if you've integrated Istio into a platform, you very likely have built your own automation to solve the sidecar problem. I won't get into the details of how that works, but you encounter a problem as an engineer, you know you're going to encounter it every three months as you upgrade Istio to keep it up to date. What are you gonna do? You're gonna automate it. And they did. Uh, which means that when we solve the sidecar problem for these users, we're solving a problem they don't have anymore. They've already written the solution to this. Furthermore, in order to adopt our solution to the problem, they're going to need to adjust their solution to the problem, turning down the parts that were particular to sidecar and updating their platform uh, in order to reflect the, uh, the new ambient mode. So uh, what, what do we take away from this? Well, uh, what I thought was difficult, maybe had been difficult at one point in time, if we had written the product this way from the beginning, that could have been pretty valuable for these users and saved them time, but they've fixed it. Uh, that's not a problem that they're facing anymore. On the flip side, uh, pulling out the network from your individual developer uh, platform or internal developer platform uh, and sticking in a new version of the network is extraordinarily expensive. Uh, any of you trying to hire for platform engineers at the moment? Uh, even, though the, uh, even though the market seems flooded with talent and you're, we're hearing stories about software engineers who put out 700 applications and heard back on two of them, somehow it's still extraordinarily difficult to find platform engineering talent. Uh, it's, a, it's a very unique skill set and it's a group of people who have to understand in depth several dozen CNCF technologies all at the same time, as well as how they map to legacy technologies for the 90% of enterprise apps that still run on VMs. So it's really difficult to hire for that. Their time is very valuable, and what we're doing with Ambient and asking them to migrate is effectively wasting their time, uh, helping them to fix a problem that they don't have. Uh, and realistically, this chart probably should look a little bit more like this. <laughs> Uh, platform engineering is hard work. These are busy people and they have more important things to do than adopt a new solution to an old problem. And, and in part, that's because I had envisioned the DevOps life cycle like this. It's a tight loop. You're releasing software, you're looking at how it can be improved and you're feeding that back in and then you're re-releasing software. The DevOps life cycle is wonderful for enterprise applications, but for platform engineers, it looks a little bit more like this. It's an extraordinarily long cycle. Uh, be that's because if you're putting 60% of your engineering investment into your platform, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> the whole point of an IDP is to empower developers, not to distract them with Istio upgrades. Uh, and so I sort of had the balance on that wrong. The, the development life cycle for a platform, what I've heard from customers since then is that probably they'll reevaluate their network in, in five or so years, unless they're given a compelling reason to do so. So that was, a, that was quite a learning from the project. I, I made another assumption though. Uh, I assumed that sidecar compute, remember you're running, if you have a thousand pods in your, in your cluster, you're running a thousand sidecars. That seems really expensive and very uh, unnecessary to me. So I assume that that was very expensive. Network egress though, it's, it's not really taking compute, it's not really taking memory, it's hitting the backbone. That must be a relatively inexpensive component of your IDP. Well, what did we hear on the Twitter space? Uh, many of our customers are running regional, or our customers are running regional clusters. Uh, and uh, what that means is that some of the nodes, uh, traffic between nodes, sorry, 
What that means is that traffic in between zones are happening within the Kubernetes cluster. It doesn't look like it's leaving the cluster, but it is leaving the building within a region. And that leaving the building is quite a bit more expensive than traffic that stays in the building. As a matter of fact, uh, we heard from several customers that their egress fees were much higher than their compute fees. We were told you could erase, you could pay our cloud bill for compute and memory. And if you don't help on the networking side, it will not matter to us. Uh, Ambient in particular makes this problem a little bit worse. If you look over here on the right side of the screen, you can imagine a sidecar with each of these services uh, and the traffic stays within a, a given zone. But once you schedule a waypoint, which is where layer seven value is added, and you've only got a, two instances of the service, each service, so you probably only need one instance of the waypoint. Well, guess what happens to zone B's traffic? Double egress. Uh, so now what was extremely cheap has become extremely expensive. Uh, the flip side is you could run a waypoint inside of each zone, in which case you begin to ask the question, well, what's the point of going to ambient? If I'm going to run uh, one proxy per pod, I can do that in a sidecar as easily like, as I can do that in a deployment. So these users told us loud and clear that ambient as it was today was not particularly interesting to them. So what I thought was very expensive, sidecar compute, turned out to be relatively inexpensive in comparison with the amazing expense that was network egress fees for our users. Um, so let's, let's talk about what, what, uh, what we learned here and how we revisit those assumptions in the Istio project. Um, really, what this, we talked for several months about this. How do we digest this feedback? What do we make of it? Should we be making ambient? Does nobody want this thing? And what we decided is, for new users of service mesh, ambient is the right architecture. For old users, it is the right architecture, but it may not be worthwhile to migrate. Not worth their time. Perhaps in a few years, they'll get to it. So our expected uptake is that new users will begin making use of ambient mode very quickly, very early on. It's well positioned to add value, and their costs should stay under control. It'll be better for them. But existing users who have already taken the time to integrate Istio into their platform are not going to go and retool everything that they've ever done in order to get uh, a 5% cost optimization or negative cost optimization depending on their egress fees. Uh, so as we went and decided that this was for new users, we have gone ahead and moved forward. Uh, we finally have announced beta. Our upcoming release in May will take ambient mesh to beta. Uh, we debated the language here quite a lot because if you dig through our announcement, you will find ambient mesh layer four is going to beta. Uh, that layer seven waypoint object is staying in alpha for now, for probably at least another six months. And the reasoning behind this is that layer four is what new users need at day zero. They need to have MTLS security across all communication that happens so that they can tell all of their security folks that they're not leaking data. And then they need basic telemetry. So, you know, layer four is not nearly as valuable as layer seven, but it gives you a baseline. Uh, it gives you a starting place. Layer seven is gonna be for more advanced use cases. And we expect that we can have that to beta by the time those customers need those use cases. So let's bring this back home to your experience uh, as a CNCF member, as someone interested in projects, as a user of those projects. What can you do with this information? Um, you're going to need to answer these questions as you build a product. And, and by need, you will answer these questions, whether implicitly intention or intentionally. Uh, and if you don't answer them with empathy, you will have built a project that is a misfit uh, for the market. Uh, these questions involve taking on the perspective of your user. What do they love? What do they hate? What are they worried about? What are they excited about? What are they upset that they have to pay for? What are they happy to pay for? If you can answer these questions the same way that your users will, you are much more likely to have a good market fit with those users and have high uptake. But that really just kicks the can down the road. All I told you is to answer those questions with empathy. So go find some empathy. I think it's in the hall out there. Uh, and you'll have everything that you need to answer these questions and build great products. Now, empathy is actually extraordinarily difficult to build. Uh, but there are some tools that you can use to get better empathy for those users. And the first goes back to that mountain climbing illustration. Don't stay at the visitor center when your users are on the trail. Uh, if you're far away, 
uh, you're going to have a difficult time understanding your users. And so our first principle is that shared perspective is going to come from shared location or proximity. And, and I mean this very literally. <laughs> Go be where your users are. I know we're all virtual today and we love video conferences. Thank you. Uh, go actually sit with them. If you have an opportunity, if you're building monitoring tooling, ask to sit with an SRE for a week and understand how they're leveraging monitoring tooling. What is important to them? What do they not care about at all? Uh, so go sit with them. The next up uh, is sort of figuratively uh, proximity. Go do what your users are doing. If you're releasing a cloud native project, install it. Run a website on it, even if the website does nothing and provides no value, dog food your own work so that you can understand what they do. And not just with your own tool, but with all of the adjacent tools in the ecosystem. This is gonna be very important. Uh, if you're releasing something that is supposed to be a part of a platform, try installing it with Argo. Try running it with Backstage or one of the other many compelling uh, platform engineering tools that are down in the, uh, down in the solutions showcase this week. Uh, get to understand not just what your product does, but how does it play with others? Because that's going to be what your users care about. That's gonna be their day zero experience with your product. Uh, and lastly, never stop listening. Uh, I've got even if you love your product, no, 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 especially. <laughs> if you have put your heart and soul into a project, it's really difficult sometimes to hear someone say, I really don't like this and I don't want to use it. That can be a devastating thing to hear. It was a devastating thing for me to hear back in October on Twitter. That if you can swallow your ego a little bit and set it aside and ask, okay, tell me more. Why is that? Not, you're wrong. I built the greatest thing ever and you should feel bad for not liking it. Instead, really, that's interesting. I didn't expect that. I'm sorry to hear that. Can you tell me a little bit more about what made this not work for you and what I might be able to change moving forward? Uh, oftentimes users come to these meetings and they know you're an open source maintainer. You've put your heart and soul into things and you're not actually getting paid for it. And so they're very hesitant to say, they'll say, oh, you know, it was, it was pretty good. Uh, anyway. Dig in, say, you know, last time I used it and installed it, I ran into this bug that was just infuriating. I couldn't believe that I had released software that did this. Did you encounter anything like that? All of a sudden you've paved the way for them to provide that information that you must get to, to have user empathy. Uh, you've made it safe for them to speak. So invite that critical feedback. I think one thing that this looks like is understanding and, and helping your customers navigate the giant puzzle box that is the CNCF. Anybody take a look at the landscape this week? Uh, did you see all of it, a part of it? If you zoom out small or far enough, you can get to where each project is a pixel. And I think at that point, you can, on some very large screens, see all of the CNCF landscape. Help your customers understand. Don't ship them a puzzle box. Uh, ship them a picture. It says, hey, if you're using Argo, this is how it integrates. Here's how to put Prometheus in touch with this project. And by giving them, rather than a puzzle box, a picture, you're showing empathy for their experience. They don't want to spend three hours trying to figure out, oh, now I have the picture and I understand what this project does and I don't need it. You're going to give that to them up front and let them understand what you've built. And together, by following the principles of user empathy, I think that we can make the CNCF and KubeCons a great place for developers, for users, uh, for all of us to continue this innovation that we've enjoyed doing for these years, and I hope that you'll join me in doing it. Uh, so that's all, that's all I've got for you today. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for, uh, for the talk. Uh, I want to ask you about the, the part where you discussed that when you released the project, you got you heard crickets. Um, first of all, how like, did you emotionally deal with that? And then how did you overcome it? Like what, you know, you're not going to fly to everybody's office and talk to them. So how did you actually get, get to the point where enough people are giving you feedback that you feel confident in what they're saying? I, I think the way to survive those crickets is, is going back to user empathy. 
I use dozens of open source projects every single day, uh, maybe even hundreds of open source projects every single day. And I've talked to developers on two or three of those projects about my experience. Uh, I'm not using those tools because I want to participate in an ecosystem. I'm using those tools because they make my life easier. And so expecting users to come to you, to take time out of their day to figure out where is the Istio GitHub and how do I create an issue and what type of issue should it be? Uh, there's a lot of barriers to that feedback. So going where your users are. Uh, Istio has been famous for some Twitter flame wars, users telling us just how badly we've gotten it. Uh, and while we can withdraw from that and say, well, I, you know, that's painful to hear, instead go there and invite that and say, okay, I hear there's problems, let's have a public forum and hear you out. Uh, Twitter was a much easier forum for our users to join than GitHub, and so I think that helped a lot. Thank you. Hi, thank you, uh, great talk. Uh, my question is, it sounds like with some of the ambient mesh stuff, you know, there's definitely a bit of a miss, right? And in hindsight, you've got great stories from your users and got great input from, from what, you know, what they really wanted, right? Uh, in hindsight now, what would you have done differently before starting the Ambient Mesh project? I think in the first year, we could have spent a lot less time worrying about layer seven, which again is for those more mature use cases. We were thinking of it as something that we needed to make sure there was a migration path from sidecars to Ambient on day one. Uh, I don't think that migration path is unimportant, I think there will be users doing that, but it's not a day one problem. It's a year two problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. How do you write up and share the user personas and the feedback so that you can then share it and analyze it and for those people who do want to help, how do you then categorize them as a, a user base for, for whether their feedback is 80% or 20%? The, the question about personas is spot on for the Istio project in particular. Uh, persona development and role development typically falls to product managers. Uh, and product management is not something that we reward today in the cloud native ecosystem. You might be a product manager for Microsoft or Google or Amazon, but you're not a product manager for Kubernetes. I think actually it would behoove us to develop those roles and to make sure that they are recognized within the community uh, so that we can promote things like roles, um, like personas. So we've struggled with that in the Istio project. We have a few documents we've written over the years. We did learn a few things early on. Our initial APIs put all the levers in one CRD. Uh, which it turns out from a security perspective is a bit of a nightmare. So learning that there were different users helped us in that journey. Um, but that's, a, that's an ongoing problem in the Istio project that I don't think I could say we have a clean solution to. As far as users who do want to submit feedback, um, we have a monthly meeting called the community meeting uh, where users are always invited to share their thoughts. Also, please just tweet at us. If you're a Twitter user, like, like uh, even if it's bad feedback, we don't mind it being in public. You don't need to feel like you're doing us a disservice. If you have used our product and it hasn't gone well, we need to know about that. And uh, that's really important. So feel free to reach out that way. We also have an Istio Slack that is fairly accessible that you're welcome to join and, and give feedback. We're going to get in the habit of having user feedback summits over the coming year. And one of the difficulties we've had with that is uh, getting people to sign up. It involves being on camera, lots of people watching, it'll be recorded and reanalyzed and things like that. But if you're willing to do that, it's incredibly valuable for the project. I'm hearing that we've run out of time. I'll still be uh, towards the back of the room for a few minutes if anyone had any follow-up questions. Thank you all for joining. <laughs>